Welcome everyone. Hello, thanks for joining us today. Um, this is the webinar to accompany publication of our 2021 research review. Um, anyone who uh, doesn't know me already, I'm Rob Farrow. I'm a senior research fellow at the Open University and uh, I coordinate the uh, research uh, work for this phase of GoGN. <clears throat> so, research reviews. Uh, let's see. So uh, first of all, just a couple of words about GoGN for the benefit of anyone watching the recording later. Uh, GoGN is the uh, Global OER Graduate Network, and we're a network of support for doctoral researchers in open education, but also just researchers in the community more generally. You can check out the website at go-gn.net. We've been going since 2013. And um, the uh, management of the network came to the Open University around 2018. Um, and so we're funded by the Hewlett Foundation and uh, we coordinate the network from the Open University in the UK. Uh, the aims of GoGN are to raise the profile of research into open education, to offer support for people conducting doctoral and postdoctoral research in the area and to investigate and develop openness as a process of research. We've got more than 100 researchers uh, who are um, either joined as doctoral candidates uh, or they're, they're still doing their uh, PhD or ED. And we've got about another 200 friends of the networks. So that's people like uh, PhD supervisors, mentors and interested practitioners. Um, so we have lots of different um, aspects to what we do. Uh, within the research strand, um, you may have uh, you may be familiar with our uh, research methods handbook and conceptual frameworks guide, which were published uh, this year and last year. And last year, we also published the first of these research reviews, um, which you can find on the uh, GoGN website. So, uh, what's the idea behind the research reviews? So, um, essentially. We were interested in finding ways to encourage members to collaborate, but also to work openly and to um, sort of investigate how the network can support people uh, in their own research uh, by leveraging a bit of sort of collective intelligence and collective activity. Uh, it's also a chance to give people some experience with publication process and preparing manuscripts for publication. Um, but we're also interested in um, collective understandings of what's happening in the world of research, what's, re what's recently come out, and um, can we arrive at a collective understanding of these things from a kind of open education perspective. And so the idea is that we're inclusive, we have different perspectives involved, we have some criticality in there as well, because sometimes people are reviewing the work from other network members, because so many people publishing in this area are now members of GoGN. Um, and also to try and create some sort of artifacts that are useful for people going forward, especially people who are coming in at the start of a PhD or ED program, um, and they can then access these collections of reviews and see what other GoGN members uh, have said in their responses. Uh, and the way the process works, um, it's not like a scientific literature review, we don't kind of um, start off with a bibliographic search and narrow it down. Um, we're more interested in sort of finding uh, areas of interest and relevance. So partly we're trying to uh, align the stuff that we're reviewing with the stuff that people work on, but ultimately um, it's all done on a voluntary basis. So if uh, a researcher says, I would like to review this, that's great. You know, it's the more the merrier. Um, so we don't claim this is like the best research, you know, or the, the, the most relevant research, but this is the stuff that people were interested in reviewing in the time frame uh, that we worked in. Uh, so we, these reviews are written between September and November. And um, the way it works is we assemble all of the reviews into a Google Doc. So there's a, an editorial process where any of the authors can go in and make some suggestions. And um, once we're happy with it, we go live. So uh, that's what happened yesterday. Um, it's not entirely free form though. So we do give some guidance to the reviewers on um, the kind of things that we're looking for. So 
here's the, the suggested prompts. You can see it's still pretty flexible. And it's really just designed to give people the prompts that they need to um, cover the right things in a review. Um, so essentially, what's it about? What are the main research claims? Are the methods robust and appropriate? Uh, does the data presented actually support the conclusions? Is the argument clear? Is it well written and accessible? Uh, is all the relevant research included? Uh, and then I, I guess a slightly more meta consideration, which is what's the relevance of this for open education research, like for the sort of specialist audience? Um, what's the important thing to know about this paper? And similarly, what's interesting about this contribution? So that's the guidance people were given. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through um, summaries of the reviews. And um, I know we've got some of the reviewers here with us today as well, so I might lean on people for a, a little bit of a personal point of view. Um, but we'll just have a bit of a discussion as we go along. It's you know quite informal. And the idea will be just to sort of um, give people a bit of space to explore some of the ideas and to find out about the kind of research that's going on at the moment. So uh, we, we organize them by category. So the first category is uh, open educational resources, but the subcategory here is theory. So these are papers that concentrate prim primarily on the theory of open educational resources. Uh, so the first one is reviewed by yours truly. Um, uh, this is LASH, the Scientific Digital Culture, or Wissenschaft's Kultur der Digitalität, Lessons Learned. Um, and this is quite a short paper, really, but I thought it had some um, pretty interesting ideas. And uh, essentially, the bit that I thought was interesting was uh, there's a claim that digital culture and digitalization in higher education has got three elements. And those three elements being referentiality. So this is the idea that no one can uh, have any sort of monopoly on knowledge. Uh, knowledge is always networked and contextual. And the idea here was that um, digitalization accelerates and catalyzes those processes. Second idea is that com communality. So the idea that uh, epistemic communities are communities of practice, which is essentially a similar way of saying the first one, but it's more about the sort of knowledge production side rather than just, you know, how it's contextualized and, and how knowledge exists within a sort of uh, framework. The third idea is um, maybe quite a sort of modern one. It's the idea of algorithmic, algorithmicity. So um, obviously algorithms. And the sense here is that um, human beings did most of the tasks associated with higher education, but machines are increasingly able to uh, take on some of these things. And the arguments made that openness cuts across all of these things. And that's partly to do with participation um, who's involved in it and how is that now coming sort of outside of universities and into more diverse uh, communities and stakeholder groups, but also uh, about transparency. So who can see that? Who can see what's happening in a university? And um, I thought there was some quite interesting ideas around this stuff, um, but it's, it's not really explored in any depth. Um, so it's more sort of categories that you might want to apply rather than like here's, here's a really well worked out uh, schema for understanding things. Um, but essentially, so it, it mentions um, three different projects and it relates it to these ideas, but it's, it's not very sort of systematic. So it's quite a sort of loose idea. And I thought that the, the most interesting thing about it was really the kind of um, the sort of strategic perspective and sort of bringing these categories, which I don't really think I've heard people talk about these categories very often. Um, so I thought I found it quite sort of stimulating from that point of view. Um, but again, it's quite short and it's really one of those papers where um, it's talking about some projects, but in some ways the projects are not kind of mature yet. And it was really the background and the kind of setup that I found the kind of interesting bit. Um, so yeah, that was the first uh, first review, and um, I don't have the chat up at the moment. But um, if uh, let me get that up, if anyone does want to um, ask a question or anything like that, 
um, feel free to just pop it in the chat at any point. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to progress. Um, if you want to talk about this, maybe we can do it at the end. No comments so far, Rob. I think. Okay. Um, just a nice comment from Kathy about the handbook. Um, who, and Kathy said good. that's so awesome. <laughs> We're leaning very heavily on it as we create research resources for librarians. Thank you. That's thank, thank you, Kathy. Kathy. That's kind. And Martin says quite an interesting framework to hang future work on. Yeah, I thought so because there's quite a flexible categories that you could, you know, very sort of contemporary. So. Um, second contribution. Uh, this is reviewed by Glenda Cox. Uh, open educational resources, a response to rising textbook cost difficulties in the transition process to OERs through the lens of Miserow's theory of transformative learning. You can kind of tell it's a German title originally, I think, but very long. Um, so I haven't read it personally, right? So I'm now moving into the language of the reviewer. Um, and so uh, the, the, the response that Glenda had was that this was a well-written summary of a larger study. So maybe some of this, some of the stuff that might come up is in, is in the larger study. Um, 16 uh, interviews, all of them are course instructors who had OER experience. And uh, you might sort of suspect that this is a kind of slightly generic study, um, which in some ways it sort of indicates how far the whole thing's come, where it's just like, oh, it's another study about textbooks, improving access and lowering costs and all that sort of stuff. But it's still important and, um, uh, and valuable. And I think the sort of new aspect or new dimension that this paper brings is this um, alignment of Mesereau's transformational theory to the process of OER adoption. I'm not familiar with Mesero. I did look up this, uh, this theory though, um, which you can see on the screen now. And so these are the 10 steps of uh, transformative learning. And I guess the, the idea is that you could sort of track the, pro the process of OER adoption through these um, different stages from disorientation down to reintegration. This is new to me. I haven't really encountered many people um, trying to articulate the stages of OER adoption in a sort of systematic way. Normally adoption is like the first bit, right? Of, uh, or substitution is like the first bit of OER adoption. So first of all, and then you, know, you move through to sort of creating your own resources and that kind of thing. So I guess this sort of relates to that first step of just you know, moving in the direction of OER, but I guess you could repeat the stages at different levels or different kind of um, approaches or more complex uh, reuse and recreation of OER. But I took this to be a kind of interesting original contribution. Yeah, this is just a Monday for Martin, right? <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it could kind of apply to, you know, almost anything new, right? Any sort of learning. Um, but, you know, new to me, and um, I mean, it's quite an, quite an old theory, I suppose, it dates from the 70s. Um, but I, saw, I thought this was probably the main kind of interesting aspect um, coming out of this review. Uh, so the next contribution, uh, open educational resources, supporting diversity and sharing in education. And this was reviewed by Paula. Um, and I think the sense here was that there was, there was another kind of generic, um, not generic in a bad way, but just, you know, it's kind of giving you the sort of potted history of um, OER. Um, and I think it was felt to be a pretty good introduction for someone who's um, completely new to OER um, because it sort of had the kind of historical, um, the historical vector running through uh, the key categories and talking about main projects and initiatives in lots of different um, places, but also making it clear that the context is also important and um, uh, it's not just a one size fits all solution with OER. So the idea there was really um, it's a useful resource, a useful paper, but um, it's nothing particularly kind of original. In, in the nicest sense, it's just a kind of competent, good treatment of the subject. Um, and so it's the kind of thing that could be good also, I suppose, for if you were 
maybe starting out um, with uh, OER or starting out on a on a, a piece of research around OER, this might be a, a good touch point to um, summarize some of the main themes and trends and that kind of thing. Uh, and it also has good signposting to uh, other bits of research and other things that you might want to look up. Okay, so um, that's the end of the first section. Um, I don't know if um, anyone has anything they'd like to raise at this point, or um, I can just continue. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so second section, also about OER, but in this case, we're focusing on impact rather than more theoretical takes. First paper, Barthi and Leonard. Uh, so the, the main summary here, um, it's written from the perspective of academic librarians and uh, the thing they're interested in testing or finding empirical support for is the idea that STEM education can be um, supported um, in terms of curriculum improvement, but also the sort of uh, the processes around uh, research and teaching. Um, improved through the use of OER. Um, and they found I mean, what might be a sort of familiar pattern. Um, there's a lack of awareness of OER and um, um, in, in within STEM especially, there was the sense of uh, specialist librarians in STEM not being aware of OER necessarily. Um, and more even more so for faculty and students so um but where they did uh where they did have where people did have awareness um you find the sort of familiar patterns where it's like actually yeah this can be quite useful and co-creating resources can improve engagement and uh, all that kind of thing um another key thing here is the idea that librarians actually need a bit of support if they're going to um, perform this kind of role in higher education institutions um, and that's partly about giving people improved awareness but also giving them the time that they need to become familiar with all the different OER options and how it works and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah pretty much a sort of librarian focused contribution but um, if anything, we probably need a bit more of those in general, given the importance of librarians to the whole process. Next paper, McDermott, open to what? Critical evaluation of OER efficacy studies in the library with the lead pipe. So um, this, this, is, this, it sounds, I haven't read the paper, but it sounded to me when I was reading Natasha's review, but it's a bit like a kind of like counter uh, counter paper for um, OER efficacy studies, uh, of which there are many, right? And um, part of the whole idea behind these efficacy studies is that they're harmonised and they look for the same key um, ca same key indicators and the same key features across lots of different studies, and that supports these various claims that people want to make about OER. Um, and this paper, I don't know how fair it is in, in the way that it approaches it, but it seems to be saying, ah, oh, yes, but look at all the things that are missed out. And there's no sort of critical perspective uh, when you're just looking at sort of coop framework stuff. Uh, and it's, you know, my hot take without actually having read it myself was that, well, yeah, um, that's probably right. There is quite a lot of stuff that you're overlooking if you uh, have this sort of reductive approach. But in a way, the reductive approach is kind of needed if you want to do that specific thing. Um, but I think I have some sympathy for the idea that um, you can mistake the part for the whole with um, efficacy studies by, you know, if you just focus on those and that's the only sort of thing that you're looking at, that's missing a lot of stuff around um, uh, OER that's quite interesting potentially. Uh, so um, two things I think, worth saying about this. Um, one is it does, uh, it does identify several areas where uh, maybe overlooked um, 
and um, I'm always in favor of sort of critical perspectives myself. I think it's really important to uh, retain a critical perspective on all kind of research, really. Um, uh, in this case, it would have been useful to have um, more quantitative support for some of the claims that are made about there being things overlooked or things lacking in, in the research landscape, because um, essentially they don't really do any of that sort of stuff where you would say, look, there's been, you know, 100 papers published this year and 50 of them have been um, efficacy studies or anything like that. So there's not really a sort of quantitative support for the idea here. Um, but I think still think it's an, it's an interesting take and I kind of like the, the idea of sort of um, counterclaims and sort of trying to bring uh, the perspective back onto uh, the wider qualities of um, OER um, uh, implementation. You might also just say, well, look, that's what open educational practices are. <laughs> that's another way to, to go with this maybe and say, well, look, yeah, it's, there's some stuff missing from efficacy studies, but that's open educational practice and that's you know, a separate thing. So interesting to think about. Um, I think this is one that um, I might read personally um, at some point. Uh, next, impact paper, uh, Verma. And um, this paper is entitled Role of Open Educational Resources to Support Higher Geoscience Education in India. And this was reviewed by Anirada. And um, I'm kind of grateful for, for uh, I don't really know much about uh, geoscience in India. Um, and so this is quite a useful paper um, for me to sort of feel like I understood a bit more about what was going on. And the idea here was people are coming um, into applying for bachelor's degrees in geoscience and um, the failure, sorry, the completion rate um, for getting onto the, the program um, at master's level was just 41%. And the idea here was people are coming up to that level and there hasn't really been any opportunity for them to learn about geoscience before that. So um, the paper gives some reasons for this and says it's partly because there's not many low cost textbook options. It's partly a language issue because there are even fewer in Indian languages. But also it can't be just sort of reduced to that. So there's sort of structural issues um, around the distribution of experts and faculty members who has access to um, laboratories and laboratory time. And um, also just a lack of places where you can actually learn this stuff before undergraduate level. Um, so the overall claim here is that OER has a value proposition for um, Indian geoscience, um, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree from what I found out from reading this paper, but there's probably so many examples like this where um, there's so much potential still for OER to make a big difference um, in specific subjects and specific uh, uh, countries and different you know, locations. So yeah, I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Um, this paper um, is another impact paper, Open Educational Resources in Public Administration, a case study in Greece. So this had two interesting things, right? One is it's about public administration and two is it's in Greece. And those two things don't often come together in an OER paper. Uh, so it's a case study. And I, I think probably we need more um, stuff around um, public sector and, and even third sector and private sector um, applications of OER. So many training um, programs going on, so much potential for OER adoption. Uh, so they seem to be a little bit ahead of the game in Greece because uh, they've got this um, OER program uh, which is supposed to engage civil servants, and there's uh, 650,000 of them um, in Greece. Um, maybe a sort of familiar picture here. Uh, OER has great potential, but we 
really have a, a need for more awareness and more training and more skills development around OER. Um, my sense is this paper is quite useful for um, the Greek context as well as the public administration context. Um, so yeah, I thought it was quite quite an interesting one. I know we've got Viv with us today. I don't know if uh, you want to add anything, Viv, or we could do this a bit later at the end. We'll do it at the end. Uh, so interesting on two fronts, I thought. Um, another one this time in Italy, uh, OER in Italy. And um, I think this had some authors who are very well versed in uh, higher education in Italy. And my sense was from reading the review that this, this came across in the way that it was written. Um, so here the idea was, there's a literature review and there's data from a survey from um, Italian rectors uh, who are basically high level managers. And um, based on this, they make a series of recommendations uh, relating to capacity building and they recommend forming a national OER repository and a platform for people to use it. And I got the sense that the, the value here is really like, um, like thoroughness in the literature review and, the, and using the data, but actually knowing the context well enough to really talk about um, the specifically Italian challenges. So um, my sense is this is probably a pretty good one if you're interested in um, Italy specifically, but also, a point of reference for other countries that might be a bit like Italy in some respects. Okay, uh, next impact paper. Incentivizing faculty for OER adoption and open textbook authoring. Uh, so this one is another case study based at this time at uh, Rutgers University in the United States. Um, and it's focused on textbook costs and had a relatively small sample of students. Um, and so, um, again, some sort of familiar tropes, you might say, uh, challenges around finding specific resources, students feel that they're benefiting from using OER, faculty less willing to uh, create their own OER, specifically for use on these courses. Um, and that's kind of the intention with this idea that uh, they're still interested in innovation and improving practice and that sort of thing, but yeah, they're not necessarily gonna go to the level of creating OER. That's kind of familiar stuff. Um, I, I took it that the, the key thing here was, there was, it was in a sort of top-down implementation. So rather than having uh, a sort of handful of advocates who are teachers who are interested in kind of moving towards OER and open textbooks, this was coming from someone higher up in management saying, we're moving in this direction. So I thought it was interesting from that point of view because those are those are kind of thinner on the ground those approaches. Okay, so that's the impact section. Um, I thought there were some you know pretty interesting little case studies there, um, and some stuff that's you know outside of what you would normally um, look at in impact studies. So I think that field's kind of getting a bit more mature in some ways, and we're seeing more examples from different places and that kind of thing. Uh, open educational practices is next. So um, first paper, uh, transformation and digital literacy, systematic literature mapping. Uh, and this is reviewed by Helen, who's uh, with us today. Uh, and essentially it's an exploration of concepts of digital transformation, digital literacy, and so on. I got the impression reading Helen's review that um, there was a kind of uh, inconsistency around how these concepts are used and used sort of interchangeably and not necessarily in, in a sort of very systematic and schematic focused way. Um, and there are also some things that were brought in from um, more business uh, orientated approaches. So talking about learners as consumers and that sort of thing, um, rather than talking about a higher education perspective. And uh, the um, open education seemed to be just a kind of 
something mentioned in passing, bearing in mind I haven't read the paper myself, it seems something mentioned in passing rather than you know something core to what was going on. Um, but the thing that caught my eye was this uh, database that they built to accompany the paper, as I understood it. So there's a database of uh, nearly 300 articles that they uh, composed for writing this. And as an open, open, uh, an open educational practice in itself, I thought this was quite an interesting um, approach. It made me think, hmm, could you have a GoGN database where we've kind of done annotated reviews of like lots of different stuff, maybe some version of you know, the research review exercise, but it exists on a database somewhere. So that was quite an interesting proposition. Um, Helen, did you want to come in on this? Because I feel like I've you know, given it a very sort of simplistic overview. You're, you're welcome to add some detail or we can just talk at the end, it's fine. Okay, so moving on, next paper. Uh, opening up educational practices through faculty, librarian and student collaboration in OER creation, moving from labor intensive to supervisory involvement. It's another snappy uh, title that you just can't forget. Uh, so here we have an overview of uh, OER implementation at Ohio University Library. Um, oh yeah, sorry, Helen. Um, I probably should have unmuted you <laughs> if I wanted you to say something. Um, which we can talk at the end, and, but uh, thanks for your, for your comment. Um, so uh, the interesting thing with this paper seemed to be the focus on labor specifically. So um, they looked at 20 stakeholders in quite a micro level um, case study um, and looked at what was the labor implication for all those different people based on um, moving towards OER. And several OER initiatives are mentioned. So there's uh, moving to open textbooks and uh, having um, assessment banks online for people to use and that kind of thing. So the main claims here were uh, that the authors said, involving students in OER creation, um, which some people call this kind of open pedagogy approach, uh, has improved student faculty librarian relationships and increased engagement, um, but also act as, as, as kind of catalyst for OVP across the institution. And I thought this kind of, triad student faculty librarian was kind of interesting and um i think uh uh we don't you know, don't necessarily think enough about the librarians again um and how sort of uh how key they are to that sort of teaching and learning uh, process in higher education especially in some universities you know, depending on the kind of model that people are using um so it's another one for the librarians but not just for the librarians I and mean, that's the point right um it's you know, sort of making that librarian contribution very central. Uh, next OEP paper, uh, OER in virtual teaching communities. Uh, so here, um, the idea was to um, understand uh, the kind of use and interpretation, I suppose, of OER in a virtual teaching community. Um, there were 11 interviews um, and they basically concluded that uh, STEM education is where there's most interest in um, OER and familiar sort of features around this, um, more flexible and more open teaching processes, better feedback loops, more learner involvement, more innovative experiences um, and I thought it was also, uh, it's also yeah, quite good that they uh, really try to contextualize the results rather than saying we've proven this we you know this we've got some data or this is the conclusion um, but really sort of saying like there's a lot of technological pedag pedagogical and personal factors involved in this and I thought that was kind of you know it was good to have that stated uh, another thing I thought was interesting about this one was that they had interviews but they also had this uh, I guess it's kind of like a very brief survey with a lot of yes, no answers. So do you agree with this? Yes, no. So in a way, it's a sort of binary version of something like a Likert um, question. But bearing in mind how difficult it can be sometimes to get people to contribute to uh, surveys and stuff like that, just a yes, no thing 
um, with lots of different stakeholders could give you some really interesting results. So yeah, I thought that was um, quite an interesting way of approaching stuff like this. On to MOOCs. Um, Martin is the MOOC master in this round of reviews. Uh, so first paper, open to MOOCs, evidence of the impact on labor market outcomes. Uh, and the focus here is looking at MOOCs, looking at MOOCs in the longer term, what difference is it making to the employability of people that take them? So in a way, this is one of those kind of hypothesis testing papers, right? Because people say, oh, you've you know, take a MOOC, your, your employment uh, prospects will improve. And this paper is trying to say, well, does it actually improve? Um, so they, they look at two MOOCs and they do some surveys and um, the main findings, uh, quite simple really, MOOC participation had no impact on wages, but it did make you more likely to stay where you are and do the same job. So maybe not what people have in mind exactly when they take a MOOC. Um, kind of interesting counterintuitive finding in some ways. Yeah, um, sorry Rob, can I just, you do, do you mind me chipping in? Not at all. Okay, uh, it's inter I did the three MOOC papers you're going to cover now, and I think the interesting thing about them was how desperately uninteresting <laughs> all the findings were. So I think, I think it's kind of, you know, you think about all the hype you had about MOOCs, um, uh, you know, years ago. And, you know, this one's like, do MOOCs help employment? Not really. It's okay. <laughs> um, and, the, and the next one, I, I guess, is, is kind of interesting by uh, a non-finder, let me come on to it. But the, the, there was no kind of finding about them. It's like, yeah, wow, you know, that makes you think they justified all the hype we had about them years ago and I think it's kind of perhaps as a lesson for educational technology initiatives more widely in that it's quite interesting so so should I, should I carry on Rob sorry I don't mean to I'll yeah, give if you, you want to do the MOOC papers that's fine so, so, so th th this one was looking at uh, gender differences in um, uh, uh, on Brazilian platform but quite a big data set and basically they didn't really find many gender differences and I guess that in some ways that, that, that is an interesting finding you know it's like um, that there, there are you know, in terms of like motivation um, and um, completion rates and those kind of things, there wasn't really any difference between men and women. So that, that that's you know, that's good in a way. I think often we thought uh, early MOOC completers tended to be men. Um, so perhaps that's that's a change. But again, it's not like a. It's like okay, that's kind of interesting, but not you know not amazing. I suppose boring is kind of good here if it means yeah that's right yeah it is that's less right. of an advantage it, 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 for men sort of thing. That's right. This one it is quite, and I think you know particularly, and it's good to kind of get the I mean, view might want to come as well on the the kind of uh, Brazilian context as well. Uh, and then uh, the next one, Rob. Uh, and this is perhaps the most interesting one. It looks at peer assessments. People might remember, you know, um, lots of people like Stephen Downs. That when we had the early MOOCs, they were saying you, know, you can't scale up formal assessment, and so lots of people promoted peer assessment as a way to realise that. Um, and uh, they were looking at uh, MOOCs on Chinese platforms and found that peer assessments were really unreliable. You got kind of people really marking the extremes with um, with peer assessment. E-portfolios worked a bit better, um, but they tend to kind of have really wide variation and they recommended don't adopt peer assessment. Although that, that, and I should stress, they, they're saying peer assessment works well in formal education when it's kind of structured much more carefully. Uh, but I think just letting people loose on MOOCs doesn't really work. And I guess, it get, you know, this is probably a completely non-surprise to everyone in this call, but it's like this whole idea that, you know, all of this stuff works better when you have educators supporting people and how to engage with stuff. And doing peer assessment is actually quite a tricky thing to do, I think, you know, and these kind of careful structuring, and it's a skill you have to learn, I think. Mm. So I think it's probably unsurprising. But I think, you know, again, the, the, these three as a, as a set, you know, wouldn't make you rush out and spend millions of pounds on MOOCs, which is what people did. So it was just interesting. <laughs> um, it's 10 years on since the year of the MOOC next year, and uh, it's actually okay. <laughs> okay, they're kind of there, they don't do much, you know, it's like, so you know, I thought that was just interesting in itself. Thanks, Martin. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, the, the sentence that's in this penultimate paragraph at the end. The reliability of peer assessment was inversely correlated to the number of reviewers per assignment and the reviews completed per reviewer. Does that mean the fewer reviews that you do, the more reliable it is? Or is it the other way around? 
<laughs> I'm obviously copied and pasted that. I can't remember this from the paper. So it's okay. inverse according to the number of viewers. So having lots of reviewers doesn't make Makes it, any it less more reliable. reliable. More yeah, reliable. and you might you might have thought you might spread it out, you know, with more reviewers, but it just kind of gets more pinging around, you know, um, and the views complete. So yeah, and, and a and reviewer doing lots of reviews um, doesn't make them any right, more. Right, spends less reliable. time on them and just eventually. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And again, that, 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 those might be counterintuitive in some ways, and I think you you might get the reverse informal education when it's kind of more structured scaffolding uh, approach, as mm -hmm. uh, Helen says in the chat. Yeah, I think quality is probably uh, better than quantity with this stuff. Um, thanks, Martin. Um, moving on, because I want to give us a little bit of time for discussion at the end, if we can. Uh, open pedagogy. So the first paper here, uh, learner perceptions of the transition to instructor-led online learning environments, facilitators and barriers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so this is a case study from Indian, Indian University and um, 35 students took part um, eight open-ended questions. So not massive amount of uh, data, but potentially good qualitative data. Um, so some people thought going online was more beneficial to them and they could focus more effectively. Others disagreed. And the thing that seemed to make the difference is that some instructors didn't change their style to teaching online. And so um, they tried to do all the same stuff that they were doing in the classroom and this doesn't work. So it may not be a massive surprise uh, to us, but um, I suppose a lot of uh, educators are still, you know, they're not doing online in any way and they've been forced into it through the pandemic. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so sometimes uh, they lost control of what was going on or people just weren't very engaged and that kind of thing. And um, I think we'll see probably quite a, more, quite a lot of these sorts of papers going forward where it's all about, you know, that kind of online pivot. Uh, next contribution, what is open pedagogy? Identifying commonalities. Uh, so here, uh, the researchers uh, went to investigate the concept of open pedagogy. And um, they started off with 938 documents. Uh, you can tell me, Helen, if, I, if I've got this right. They reduce it down to 24 articles, but it's not entirely clear how they ended up with those 24. And then they developed this framework which is on the next slide, and uh, I took a copy of it. Um, before we look at it, the basic conclusion here seemed to be, yeah, that's, that's an interesting take on it, but it's not comprehensive. Um, and Helen mentioned uh, criticality and social justice not really being in there at all. Um, but it's maybe still useful as an overview for how you might think about open pedagogy. So here's a sort of five level Venn diagram. Um, I'm not sure, exactly what's supposed to happen in the overlaps, maybe any, if anything. Um, but uh, the five kind of parameters of this are uh, diversity of cultural voices, a design partner, participatory pedagogy, open licensing, uh, non-formal learning, and a culture of collaboration. Um, without seeing exactly how they ended up with those five, it's hard to tell, but you know, potentially useful for people. And if you want to add anything to that, Helen. I think one of the, the interesting things with this one is they, they pulled in information from blog posts as well as um, peer reviewed articles. And I think that just adds some depth. But I think, again, the framing of where, again, was very limited in, um, in how they selected the, the, you know, papers, blogs that, that they were referring to. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's the, that's the sense I got from your review as well. Um, but it seems like it could be useful, um, even if eventually someone adds a sixth circle or something to it. Um, next paper. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, exploring student perceptions as co-authors of course material. Uh, so this was a, a survey. Um, and uh, 92 people completed the survey. Uh, and this is after having been involved in um, creating, co-creating content for the course. And there's a bit of background information, you know, why they were doing this down because of attrition and, and so on. Um, I thought it was potentially useful that the questions uh, that they asked were av available as an appendix uh, to the paper, which 
is a kind of good open practice. Um, overall, I think the, the results were sort of underwhelming, if I can put it that way, is from reading between the lines a little bit. Um, I think it seems like people were interested and um, there's again the sort of potential there. Um, and I think it adds a bit of support to the idea of co-creation, you know, being further explored as a, a sort of approach to pedagogy. Um, innovation. So um, uh, I've got a bit of a focus on innovation at the moment for a project. So um, I took a couple of the reviews here. Um, the first one is um, about a new tool called Converter, Converter, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, and so uh, the authors have built a tool called Converter, and the idea is that it sort of semi-automates OER production. So um, the tool that they've got can take something that you've written and then it will substitute out images that you've used and put in an open equivalent with all of the license information, the metadata and, and so on. Um, and there's an evaluation in there, but it's it's super brief. And um, it's, you know, really just a pilot, I would say. Uh, and it's quite generic, doesn't really go into much detail. 90% you know, of people said they, they thought it could be a useful tool, um, but only 50% odd said that they actually got good results using it. Um, and it seemed like one to watch to me because it's one of those things where it has a use case and it has some potential, but they're at a very, very early stage of um, building it at the moment, it seems. Uh, but yeah, interesting tool. Um, the last one that I reviewed uh, is a paper about micro-credentials. And um, I actually thought this was one of the better things that I've read about um, micro-credentials, um, which you know, is not really a surprise looking at, looking at the authors and stuff. Um, but a very good sort of overview of the landscape of micro-credentials as a whole, the motivations for moving in that direction, what the, you know, the complications are and that kind of thing. And um, looking at it from different stakeholder perspectives and um, uh, quite holistic take on the whole thing. So I would recommend it if you're looking for something on micro-credentials. Um, is essentially the conclusion for the whole thing is that we need an ecosystem which is more um, sort of coherent and holistic um, and transparent, which can sort of straddle higher education and business and, and government, I guess, effectively. Um, so you've got mutual recognition of what's been achieved by each of those different stakeholder groups. Um, and it suggested that in Europe, for instance, where you've got the kind of um, overarching uh, infrastructure provided by the European Union, you've got um, a route towards that. So you need a kind of coordinating agent, I suppose, for um, making sense of uh, micro-credential strategies across different sectors and different stakeholders. But yeah, I thought it was, um, I thought it was a pretty good paper. Uh, this one was reviewed by Beck, Navigating Support Models for OER Publishing, Case Studies from the University of Houston and the University of Washington. And um, I would say these are the sort of familiar OER adoption style case studies. And um, it goes through detail for the review process for open textbooks and how they get adopted, what kind of uh, checks are made for you know, accessibility and so on. Um, and essentially they're sort of very detailed case studies about that process, probably more relevant to audiences in the USA than uh, outside, um, but still, you know, good benchmarks for the kind of detailed studies that, um, that we need to see. So, um, so yeah, um, I think that's where to look if you're looking for that kind of thing. Um, didn't get a strong sense of a kind of innovation aspect from it though in the end um, unless you you know you might fairly consider OER adoption itself to be quite innovative uh, which it is. Uh, final category social justice. Um, first paper advancing social justice for asylum seekers and refugees in the UK an open education approach to strengthening capacity to refugees action frontline immigration advice project. It's another long one. 
Um, so here the focus is the failing asylum system of Britain um, and the actions being taken by uh, charities um, to uh, uh, give advice um, to different stakeholders um, in managing the situation. And the idea here is that you can create OER um, for social justice. And so they look at several different projects. Um, I think it was 22 projects. And um, the, they identify these different dimensions uh, for social justice within uh, open education. So deliberative iterative design, access to provision, flexibility of provision, development of resources, support, and advancing knowledge and skills while adapting to the workplace. Um, this is an interesting area to me. I think it's quite, it's kind of putting your money where your mouth is with the social justice stuff, right? It's very applied and very kind of immediate um, looking at uh, refugee action. So, um, but I also thought this, this kind of list of the dimensions of open education for social justice were nicely concise and could potentially be applied in different um, cases. So I thought it was pretty interesting from that point of view. Uh, open education and resources and social justice, potentials and implications, for research productivity in higher education institutions. Uh, so here is a kind of systematic review of projects and um, a few recommendations are made around um, increasing the uh, the impact of so it's 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 the sort of triangular relationship between OER social justice and research productivity and um, they make several recommendations um, raising awareness among stakeholders um, putting in place open publication divisions the old open press returns um, and to basically create publications and journals for emerging areas Establishing the appropriate infrastructure for ICT facilities and research centres and online information and infrastructural development through the creation of institutional research funds. Um, so, um, again, it's that kind of attempt to make things a bit more applied around the social justice, I suppose, moving it away from sort of theoretical um, concern. And um, uh, I don't know if it's Paco. Are you here, Paco? Yes, here I am. Did you want to say anything about about this paper? Because um, you say that it basically it lacks um, innovative proposals and kind of just repeats some of the stuff you know that we've seen before. Did you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's an interesting review. So it goes in detail through the projects, but I, I guess it could have been taking more benefit of that in, in giving pointers for future research. That's the feeling it gets when you you finish reading the uh, the paper. But indeed, quite quite interesting as the previous one. I think one of the relevant aspects of this type of reviews is trying to get to know areas in which you are not, not an expert, which is my case. So I found it quite uh, useful to understand initiatives that are being done around. But I guess, uh, yeah, my, my critic could be that it could have gone a bit uh, further. That's great, thank you. So um, I think this is the, the final one now. Uh, framing open educational uh, open educational practices from a social justice perspective, and this is where one of the papers from Giant. Um, um, so Helen, uh, you reviewed this. Did you want to give us the the overview? I think one of the pieces for this paper is the the relevant practical applications that came from the practices of the the three authors and how they connected it then to that social justice framework that uh, came out of the research. I, I actually went back to the original papers to see what that framework looked like and it really helped inform this when I was reading the paper. But it just really uh, good, it, it was a, a challenge to critique or um, critique uh, clearly because there were there's so much in it. Um, the charts themselves, I, I had to go back to, to reread the charts that are presented because they provide so much that supports the written paper itself. So um, well worth the read um, and, and adds a, a significantly to my own practice. Um, so I, I appreciate the work they put into this. 
that's great thank you and um you helpfully also provided us with uh, an illustration right so this is um helen's take on uh, the framework that's discussed in this paper um which now you that's an oer that's out there now as an oer doing stuff um and it's uh, it's also in the uh, paper version of the uh research review and and again it really this is my way of trying to to kind of build understanding and make sense of some of the the uh i said i don't want to say it's a mess but there there's some logical sequence to the paper but i i had to look at it differently um and i tried to conceptualize that in in some type of an issue and that center of the flower is where all the real magic is happening like mm -hmm. the seeds of all these open pedagogical practices that they talk about yeah, there's so many dimensions to the social justice uh, considerations that can be really hard to capture everything. So yeah, I think uh, between between you and the authors, you've done a pretty good job there. So um, gone a little bit uh, over the time that I wanted to just basically waffle on for. Um, so I want to say thanks to all of our contributors. Um, I won't go through the names, but some of them are here with us today. Thank you, thank you everyone, for uh, your efforts that make this kind of thing possible. Um, uh, we don't really have any time for discussion in practice because it's now five o'clock, but I'm happy to um, just have a bit of a quick, you know, chat if you want to. Um, I know some of us have other things that we need to go on to. Um, I also wanted to just briefly say, look out for the call for participation in 2022. Um, this will be a summer one. So I think we'll probably come out around sort of April, March, April, May, something like that, but we're not sure yet. Um, but have a think if there's anything that you wanna see covered or you see some interesting papers, um, they don't even have to be papers. They could be something else. It could be a blog post, it could be a video or whatever let me know and we can incorporate it into the the bank of stuff that we're asking people to review um so please bear that in mind and yeah just thanks everyone thanks for coming thanks for your interest thanks for your contributions um if